Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Forbes Riley. Forbes Riley mesmerizes audiences with her authentic, inspirational style that is second to none, often referred to as Oprah meets Tony Robbins. I love that. She transports, transforms, and transfixes audiences from 100 to 10,000 as one of the pioneers behind the as seen on TV infomercial phenomenon, Forbes Riley has hosted 180 plus infomercials and guested on QVC HSN with more than 350 products generating more than 2.5 billion in global sales. 20 of her shows including Jack LaLanne Juicer, Montel Williams, Healthmaster, have exceeded $100 million in revenue. As a health and fitness expert, Forbes was inducted into the National Fitness Hall of Fame, and she is the creator and CEO of the fitness phenomenon Spin Gym. The product alone has sold you ready for this? More than 2 million units, but it's made more than like 2.5 billion. I don't know. I think she's sold over $2.5 billion in product. And I'm not sure if it was just the spend gym, but that to me imp is impressive. And she has a team of worldwide brand ambassadors promoting workplace wellness to major corporations. And if that's not enough, she is an actress who has starred in so many different movies, sitcoms, hosted a game show. I mean, the list is endless. And she knows many of the personalities that I've had on the show, Body by Jake, Elaine Lelaine. The list just goes on with the people and oh, I interviewed Suzanne Summers for Miss Fitness Magazine and just the people that she knows and has rubbed elbows with all because of her tenacity and perseverance. I know today this is a treat, you guys. I have been watching Forbes from afar for the last 12 months and I was blown away by her from the first meeting and today she did not disappoint. I can see why whenever she speaks, she brings down the house. She is 61 and full of fire. She was born ready and she brings it today. And a lot of what we talked about was her story, which is fascinating. She's a great storyteller and just going after your dreams and asking for what you want and knowing what is it that you want and calling it out into the universe and speaking your dreams into reality. Forbes also tells us how we can tell our story and get our audience engaged. And also she is an amazing speaker. She's spoken on stages like Grant Cardone and just so many different events to tens of thousands of people, but she is so down to earth and she truly cares about people. And that was what struck me from the very first time I met her is she is just there to help people to become better and I guess step into who they really are. So without further ado, I cannot do this woman justice. I could talk about her all day, but let me just say she's one of the most favorite guests I've had on the show. So let's tune in. Guys, I am so excited today to have the Forbes Riley on the Sisterhood of Sweat. Welcome, wow. Forbes. I just love the title, Miss Linda. Let me tell you something. That is the foundation of everything I do. From being in a sauna all the time to being in the gym or working out, you got to sweat. That is like, that is life. That is. And it just gives you that zest for everything you do. 
And I, I tell people when they come in, you're going to sweat. Like, cause it's like when they, I used to teach water aerobics, they get in the water and think they're not going to get wet. I'm like, I got a secret for you. You're going to get wet. That is so, <laughs> that is so funny. Well, I'm excited to meet you. This was kind of serendipitous how that happened. And I'm really, really glad that we did. I'm so excited today. And you probably don't know this Forb, Forbes, but you had me on a master class of yours and I literally had never met you before. I, I had you, I fell in love with you on clubhouse. Let's just say it. Your energy is just off the charts. And I'm like, how young is she? Like, I am just like blown away by the energy that you possess from morning till night. Cause I will hear you in the morning. I will hear you at, hear you at night. And you had me on your masterclass and I had watched you with your spin gym, which we'll dive into a little later. Mm. I was just amazed with your energy, your advice, the whole thing. But well, I'm being honest to you. I had been taking a nap on a Sunday and I was groggy as hell. And you called me out right away. And this the beginning of the podcast i'm sitting there like deer in the headlights and you are going for the guts the heart the you are doing surgery on me and that had that was painful actually i got oh, stop. i am serious i stopped talking okay and you see i talk a lot i stopped and i almost cried because you got right to the heart of the matter what right did i say it. to you you were asking me what my why was, and you know how nobody ever says what they do like correctly. They tell you a million things and, and they're not really telling you like their story could be like years long, but you showed me how to condense my story into one sentence. And yeah. I have used that ever since. In fact, I just used it on my New York times billboard. So with that no. said, Wait, you used it on a New York Times billboard? What are you saying? I love this. I uh, I said that I wanted to be on a billboard and it happened in a month. You know what? That is spectacular. That is exactly how we manifest. And you know, it's funny because I love teaching pitch. For those of you who may not know me, um, you do actually, if you were alive in the last 30 years, because I've spent most of my life on television. But I also spent most of my life not being the focus of attention. I supported the guys in my life. I supported Body by Jake for five years as his right hand. I supported in infomercials everyone from Tony Little to Beach Bodies, Tony Horton to George Foreman to Billy Mays to Ty Bo. I have all of them. And it was never about me. And I, I didn't mind it back then because I only had so much of an ego and I was I'm not as self-confident as I was back, you know, I, I'm much and I'm in a very different state of mind now where I realize that number one, as a woman, I have a lot to say. It's very important that I'm heard and I'm, it's important that I'm heard so that other women are heard. But growing up, that wasn't really the case. You kind of acquiesced to the man in the room and I've learned a lot. And now I'm on a mission and twofold. One is my kids just turned 19, my twins. And so for 18 years, I've been raising babies. I've still been working on home shopping. I've done 194 infomercials. And I've grossed a little over two and a half billion dollars. Oh, and then Jack LaLanne. I stood next to the godfather of, sweat, of, of, of fitness. And I don't think I can explain how the journey happened. I'm just so damn glad that it did. And then I learned a thing or two along the way. And now I get to share these lessons with everyone else. But as you pointed out, I know some pretty damn amazing people like Elaine Lane, Jack's wife. Jack was 88 when I met him, sadly 96 when he passed away. Elaine is 95. I just spent the last two summers with her. I am the forward in her book. I mean, this woman could have had Schwarzenegger would do anything for her and she chose me. I love that energy. And of course, I look at her 30 years down the road from me going, I have to keep the fitness level up because she's crushing it. And it's just been such a fun journey. But the thing that I give to entrepreneurs, two things. One, I created a fitness empire and you want to know how I did that as I'm also in the National Fitness Hall of Fame, things that have happened along the way. But what I do for most entrepreneurs now is this pitching ability to teach you to articulate what you do so well that you become irresistible and how you talk to yourself and other people. If we can change that. Oh my gosh, Linda, we're inspiring people to gain confidence, to share their ideas, to no longer hide in the dark, to be worried about what they're saying 
and making a radical difference in up-leveling their lives. And I love and it. I think you become more confident when you've thought about the process of what you want to say and you know what to say, because when you don't know what to say, you feel so unconfident when somebody like Forbes Riley calls on you or, you know, and it could be anything. Somebody calls on you and you are stuttering because you don't know how to put it into words. And I think that's a gift, Forbes. And I love that you are helping people morning, noon and night. And you didn't fall there by accident. It, you went from starting out in all these infomercials and doing all these things that somehow meshed together. But when was that moment that you just gave yourself permission to shine brightly and just be who you are last week <laughs> uh, not, and that's not so funny i will tell you it's an interesting <laughs> moment right it is a culmination the way you become confident is you win and the more you win the more confidence you gain and so I started out life as an ugly little girl. I had a broken nose and frizzy hair. I had braces for eight years of my life. For two of those years, I had a tongue crusher, so I couldn't talk. And I had no confidence in who and what I was. But I knew that I was smart. And I thought in my heart that I had something special. Now, I believe that's true for all of us. Whether you act on it or not, that's your choice. And for many years, I didn't do much with it. And I suffered a fair amount of bullying. And I went off to New York and I said, I'm going to be an actress. Now. The funny thing about that, there's a lot of stories. You could listen to me tell stories for about 94 years. Um, I went to college to be a lawyer because that's what you did in my high school. If you were smart, you were a doctor or a lawyer. You don't like blood, you're a lawyer. And there I'm in college going, I don't want to be a lawyer. But there weren't a lot of options. But I said, I want to be an actress. I'd always watch TV shows and I've always imagined that was possible. And my senior year of college, and it only takes one person to believe in you over and over and over again. So I'm in college, I'm in drama class, and I'd auditioned for plays all throughout high school and I never got anything bigger than chorus or townsperson number three. Very debilitating. You out there and you audition and you're, well, you don't even have a name for your character. And so I auditioned the senior year for Rosalind, Shakespeare's As You Like It, the biggest play that he wrote for a woman. And she gets to do everything. She gets to dress like a boy and she does all these antics and has so much fun. Of course I auditioned. I go to the call board to see what, you know, what townsperson role I got. And my name's not even there. And there was a moment where I looked and thought, really, I'm that bad. And I, I and then I remember, well, who's the lucky girl who gets to play Rosalind? I got to the very top of the list and there's Rosalind and oh my God, there's my name. And I remember looking at it thinking, I think somebody made a mistake. What? Like you've dreamt of something so long and then it came true. I went to my professor and I said, um, you have to help me understand this. Okay, this is a dream, but why me? Why would you risk it all on me? And he sat me down. And he said, what are you talking about? He said, you're my ideal Rosalind. I'm like, excuse me? He said, yeah. He said, all the skills that you've got, the vocal quality, the this, the that. And I just, I can't wait for you to know. The crazy thing about Professor David Richmond, though, Linda, is that when he looked at me, he didn't really see me because he was 100% blind. Oh, my so, gosh. Right. You know what he did see? He saw who I really was not what everybody else focused on the outside. He didn't care if my thighs might've been a little chunky or my hair was a little frizzy. He saw who I really was, gave me the role. I crushed it, I have the reviews. And based on his belief and that experience, I called my parents and I said, I love you very much. I know it was very hard to get me through college financially. I'm going to New York, I'm gonna be an actress. And I'm, my mom is like, we can't help you. I said, I know, I'll be okay. And I actually got the lead role in the very first feature film I auditioned for. And I starred in a movie called Splatter University, which today has its own Facebook page. And it was a, you know, a silly slasher movie, but I had the best time. And then I made a living as an actress and I worked on Broadway with Christopher Reeve and I did soap operas and I overcame a lot. I was always fighting my weight though. That was the big thing people would just get on me about. I was, I just was bigger than other people. And bigger by the way, back then meant you that you weren't 10 pounds underweight. I was 20 pounds overweight. Well, you would have thought that I was a house and I was made to go to Overeaters Anonymous and I was put on diets and I was made to be miserable and that ate away at my self-esteem. So can you imagine this internal struggle? I think I'm special, but everyone tells me I'm talented, but oh, with a face like that, you're, you're so zoftic, you're like chunky. I'm like, oh, 
It was the bane <laughs> of my existence. And I, it, it, it helped, it, I lost a lot of roles from that, but I also gained a lot. Um, and then I, I'm a very, apparently as I'm looking back on my 20s, I'm in awe of the younger me. So there was a moment during the Me Too movement back then, which no one talked about, where I couldn't get an agent. I had agents chase me around the desk. I had agents want to take lunch meetings in their hotel rooms. I had, a, you know, you're 20 years old and you're cute. You got a lot of these. And it didn't quite process. I thought all of them were stupid. I had no desire to sleep my way anywhere. I was raised with some pretty strict moral compass, so much so that my mom pretty much convinced me you needed to get married to the guy that you lost your virginity to. That's a other conversation. Oh, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and when I couldn't find a manager or an agent to represent me, oh I goodness. broke it down, figure out how people got cast, what these things called the breakdowns were. And I, with no asking permission of anybody, made up stationery with CMA, Creative Management for Artists. And I hired a woman named Lindsay Maxwell. And Lindsay was this very British woman, very proper. And she just adored Forbes Riley, just a wonderful actress. She really, I was Lindsay. I got on the phone and freaking lied as my own manager for three years. I think that's perfect. <laughs> it worked. I got movies. I got commercials. I got all kinds. And I never got caught. And I didn't even tell anybody until recently, because now 40 years later, nobody cares. But I was terrified somebody would find out that Lindsay Maxwell didn't really exist. But I will tell you, it changed my whole life. So one of the things in my life that I talk about is granting yourself permission when everyone else says no. I defined the word no to be never ending opportunity. You tell me no, I'm gonna find a way around it. Now, but you also have a little bit of an imposter syndrome, true imposter syndrome when you are playing your own manager. And back in those days, we had beepers and pay phones and I was making myself a little crazy, but it worked. And then when I got out to LA, I did a little bit of the same thing. And, I, and then I realized I have eclectic talent. So I, and, and this is where I encourage young entrepreneurs to knock it off. You do not need to know what your brand is at 12 or at 20. At 20, I got Europe on $20 a day and I went off to Europe with a backpack and $2,000 and I stayed there for six months living life. Do that, live your life. And I did that because I had this vision that one day I was gonna write a story of all these amazing adventures that had happened to me, like in the movies. Well, I'll tell you what, I met a guy who was smuggling drugs up through Spain. He didn't wanna get caught. So he grabbed my knapsack and jumped off the back of a moving train in Figuera, Spain to see the Salvador Dali Museum. That's a good story. I have a story of sleeping in caves when I got to Santorini, of stowing away inside a moving train because I couldn't afford a ticket. I have all kinds of stories. I set out to do that. Then I got back to New York. I'm auditioning. I'm working a little bit, but it wasn't happening fast enough. And so one day I took a trip to Club Med. Now, nobody seems to know what this world is, but at Club Med, they were the, it was the ultimate all-inclusive before all-inclusives were a thing. And they had a theater and all the people who entertained in the theater were people who worked there. They didn't like on a cruise ship, they didn't bring in talent. If you were in the bakery department, you had to perform the comedy routine. If you were the tennis pro, you did that sketch. If, so we, everybody had to do their own stuff, right? So marginally talented. But they did this thing that no one had ever really heard of called lip syncing. They would take a Broadway <laughs> album like Cats or Chorus Line, they'd play the album and we would all, the people there would just lip sync, right? And that's very entertaining. It well, is, yes. Yeah. Right. I, I can't sing. So I knew I was never <laughs> I was never gonna be a big Broadway star, but I wanted to play some of those characters. So Linda, I'm sitting in the audience one night and they're doing a chorus line. And I thought, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be on that stage lip singing a chorus line because I can dance, but I can't sing. And when I said, Hey, how do I get to do this? They're like, Well, you don't work for us. I'm like, Well, then I'll figure out how to do that. And so I got back to New York City. True story. Uh, and again, I don't know the rules. I've never had a job. I don't know how you're supposed to do it. So I never obeyed the rules. I always made up my own rules. <laughs> it worked out. So you know, it be is careful. better to make up your own rules. Well, yes and no. I, I have to be careful how I preach this. I walked up to the corporate office of Club Med and I said to the loader, the receptionist, I said, I said, I need to speak to the head of entertainment. Now, you wouldn't do this nowadays. Like if you know the rules, you wouldn't do this, but I didn't. And he said, oh, do you mean John Shelley? I said, yes, I'd like to meet John Shelley. And she said, does he have an appointment? I said, no, but he's gonna wanna meet me. And I said it with such a way that she said, okay. 
You said so with that, such authority. <laughs> because he did. I, I think I knew that I could make their entertainment better. They had a very French run organization and I just didn't think it was working and I had ideas and he needed to hear them. I'm sitting in his office and he said, so uh, what can I do for you? And I think I said, <laughs> it's not what you can do for me. It's what I can do for you. I said, I was observing in the last two weeks how you did this, 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 and this, and I think things could be different, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, really? I said, yeah. Then he says, how long can you go for? And I'm like, what do you mean go? He's like, well, we need somebody in Mexico to be the host of a club out there at Sonora Bay, and I would like to offer that to you. And I'm like, really? I said, I could go for a couple of weeks. He said, great, let's book you for three weeks. Pick up your airline ticket and you leave on Sunday. Okay, did I just create a job? I... Now, here's the crazy thing when I got there. I know, this is where my mind goes. I, we don't want to put this to some good use at some point. I <laughs> always wanted to be a game show host. That was one of my things. I also wanted to be James Bond. Okay, you put those things together, you've got to, who knows. But James Bond, well, but wanting to be James Bond has allowed me to, to, you know, fly airplanes, snow ski off mountains, scuba dive, live in Monaco, all the things that he would have done because it was a passion of mine. Not to be a Bond girl, but to have the adventurous life of a James Bond. And so, but a game show host. Well, again, no one's ever given me permission to do this. I don't know where I get downloaded this permission thing. But I know at Club Med, all the sports end at four o'clock and the eve dinner starts at 6.30. There was never anything to do between four and 6.30. I was bored out of my mind. And I said, but they have a little theater. I'm like, what if you did like a game show? So get this. When I arrived at the club, they didn't know what I was supposed to do. <clears throat> I was going to help take over the hosting position. I said, well, I said to them, I said, I'm here to also create your game show playlist. They're like, really? I said, yes, I'm going to need your set builders to build me a Hollywood Squares dating game, family feud, um, Price is Right, and something else. And we're going to play that every one every night. And they were like, okay. I said, and I'm the host. And that's what I did. And it was a massive hit. And the president of Club Med flew down to figure out what this crazy girl was doing at their club and offered me a full-time position creating games and shows and things. I didn't answer an ad. I just created what I thought needed to be done and I wanted to do it. And then the final piece of this crazy puzzle is that I wanted to learn to ski. James Bond knew how to ski. I couldn't afford to ski. So I get to New York and there's an ad in the newspaper for a company called Ski View. This is a company that makes billboards that go on lift towers. I didn't even know what a lift tower really was, but they were looking for a bar, a club med style bar party to help promote these billboards. One of their clients was Jose Cuervo Tequila. Okay. So this is what I teach other people, how to be outrageous. If you're going into a company and they talk about skiing, they're going to ask if you know how to ski. I don't ever, I've never skied. So what are you going to say? Linda, what would you say? What am I going to say if they ask me if I know how to ski? Yeah. I'm going to tell them I don't know how to ski. Then you're not going to get the job. But uh, what, what job am I going for? Ski instructor? <laughs> no, no, no. This is to be the host. They just wanted somebody to ski. And it turns out the reason they wanted someone who could ski was that you could ski with the clients. It was not technically part of the job. Oh, oh okay. I'll learn. I'll learn how to ski. Or. Not, so or, when you're say something, they're not interested in that. They wanted someone who knew how to ski. So when they asked me, I said, yes. And then under my breath, oh, I said, do you know how to and I said, yes. yes. And I said under my breath, just not yet. Yep, yep, so yep. I got the job. And then uh -huh. he said, great, we'll see you in three weeks at this ski mountain. I immediately booked a, a ticket to a mountain owned by Club Med and enrolled myself in ski school for two weeks. And when I showed up, I absolutely knew how to ski and I had that job for 10 years. Oh That's my gosh. I love, love, love that story. I love that so much. My dad did something similar. He told them he didn't know, you know, like they were asking him, can he drive? And he said he, he could, and he couldn't. <laughs> I mean, he had to learn real quick. And because he was driving the vice president around the first day on the freaking job. And he said he turned down the railroad tracks. Oh, that's terrible. Oh my God. That's crazy. That's did crazy. not get fired, but I get your story because sometimes you have to just say, yes, I know how to do that and figure it out. That's what, well, that's what I've always done. I've always said yes and figure it out. And I've learned a couple of great lessons. And one of them turns out to be with somebody that you just, you know, talk about men, body by Jake changed my life. Body by Jake changed the face of an industry 
And I don't know if we really acknowledge that, but prior to him and I doing a thing called Fit TV, there was no QVC or HSN. Nobody was selling fitness products on television. Mm -hmm. And we created a 24 hour network and he had a lot of faith in me. And the problem for me was back then, I didn't have a whole lot of faith in me. I did and I didn't. It was always this crazy dichotomy. And so I knew I could speak and I obviously knew how to pitch. That's one of the things that was the audition. But I, all the girls who we had show up, the fitness models, they all wore bra tops, had great abs and cute little butts. I was a little bigger on the bottom. And if you notice when I showed you that videotape, I always wore a jacket to cover up my butt. And I especially made these because I was not gonna let that stand in my way. And sure I love enough, it. I love it. We, we did 1500 products in five years. He sold that network to Fox for $500 million. That is amazing. And I love your ingenuity. I love when I'm listening to you tell the story, just how you weren't letting anything stop you or get in your way. And for everybody out there listening today that has found themselves in your shoes in a different way way at their job or with their dreams that they want. How can you tell them how important it is today to dream big, first of all, and to give themselves permission, second of all? Well, it's funny that you say that. I actually created a thing called a permission card. I have a steel card that says, I hereby grant you, you be the you, that you say in the mirror, permission to fill in the blank. Because I don't believe that many of you um, have the ability to grant yourself permission because you've been denied it so much. And what do I mean by that? By the time you're in first grade, you've been denied permission about a thousand times. Mommy, can I do it? No, mommy, can I, no. Can I, can I leave the table? No. At some point we are conditioned as a society that when we want something, we are told no. And to those people, no means stop. Well, for me, no means never ending opportunity. You get a no, I just keep going. So I don't mind getting no's, but you have to, it's a muscle that you need to start to exercise. There are things that you don't have permission to do. You don't have permission to kill somebody. You don't have permission to run a red light. Those are laws. But do you have permission to raise your hand and ask a question? Do you have permission to state who and what you are? Do you have permission to ask what you want? And the truth is most people have been denied so much that they've lost the ability to dream accurately. What do I mean by that? Well, Hey, Grubhub. Yes, ma'am. What do you want? I want food. That's nice, Grub. What do you want? I want something to eat. I'm hungry. That's nice. What do you want? Well, I don't want a hamburger. I had that. They hang up on you. Okay. So now imagine that Grubhub is the angels of the universe. Hey, Forbes, what do you want? And if you don't tell them specifically, you're going to get leftovers. And as I think you've experienced that once you write things down or vision boarded or see it and truly believe it's happened, Somehow the universe conspires to make that happen. So watch this. Hello, Grubhub. Yes, ma'am. What do you want? I would like a Caesar salad, extra chicken, croutons on the side. 20 minutes later at your door is a Caesar salad, extra chicken, croutons on the side. How did they know? Because you told them and you expected it. So if a tuna fish showed up, you go, no, nope, don't want that. So when you're looking for a partner in life and you say, I just want somebody who's funny. Somebody is funny will show up with a big round belly and balding and you only ask for funny. Do you know when I was looking to start my, the last relationship in my life, love wise, um, I said, not only do I want someone who is intuitive, sensitive, uh, can understand what I'm doing, blah, 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 but I said, I wanted someone who looks like he walked off the cover of a romance novel. And I said it and I wrote it down. It was one of my girlfriends. <laughs> And I will tell you, <laughs> Joshua walked in and there's a picture of Joshua. Did I get what I asked for? You did. Now, the crazy thing is that's, you know, that's almost, how did you do that? Well, I asked for it. That's all I can tell you. And when he showed up, I, I asked for a couple of other things about how nice and how sweet I needed someone to uplift me, as opposed to some people I'd been involved with who got off on telling me that I was not enough. And that narcissistic behavior does not work anymore. And I, you get what you tolerate. Oh, so, absolutely. You are tolerate, preaching to the choir today on that. You tolerate mediocrity. I mean, that's you. How did you get your billboard? I asked, I asked for it. And 
I received it within four weeks. I'm on the billboard starting was yesterday for two weeks in Times Square. I asked, I received, and you know what? It happened so fast. It almost freaked me out a little. I'm very excited by that. Well, so I'm going to talk about my spin gym for a second, because one of the things that had been asked of me, especially while I was working with Body by Jake was Forbes, how come you haven't put your name on a product? And Denise Austin was doing that. Jane Fonda, Suzanne Summers, all had their names on products. And I thought in the back of my head, that little insecure part of me said, well, who are you? Why would anybody care about you? Well, that goes for anybody. Why does anybody care about anybody? Who is Suzanne Summers or Tony? Nobody really. You have to have the confidence to do that. And then I said, well, I haven't found a product that is just uniquely mine. I didn't want certain things I wanted. I couldn't figure it out. Okay. But then I had, I wrote it down. I said, I will have my own exercise product. And then I thought about it and thought about it. Well, one day I'm doing a resistance band and it slips off my foot and shatters my nose. Now I'm in the hospital. Not good. And two things. My agent called and she said, I have an audition for you for a national talk show. And I had a brace on my face that looked like this. But one of my mentors says, you always show up. Well, I did with the brace on my face, a little high on morphine. And I got the job, which was crazy. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Well, there were a lot of very well-known newscasters and actors who wanted this. And I was doing the little uh, audition and this woman looked up at me. She's like, well, don't you just look like Hannibal Lecter? And I looked at her <laughs> and I said, well, good. Now I know who I'm having for lunch. <laughs> yeah, that's how you make lemonade. And so now I'm on this quest. You know, okay, where's my product? I'm going to find my product. And I must have said it a hundred every, every time I'm going to be, where's my product? I'm over in the UK and I am, I did a lot of QVC and a lot of HSN. And I, I've hit a little bit of a rock bottom. There was a lot of things that have happened in my life that <clears throat> might have just, could have destroyed me, including losing both of my parents within a year. Uh, I raised a little boy from South Central Los Angeles for 12 years of his life. He was best man at my wedding. Six months after my twins were born, Dexter was murdered. And just like you see the cover of the LA Times, that was my wedding photo. He was my best man on the cover. And for three years, we set out to find who did it. It was very debilitating, very strange, very stressful, and also raising two babies and having a career. But I kept saying, I'm going to find my product. I'm going to find this thing that will define me. And I, I made it very clear to the universe that this was not negotiable. And I'm sitting now, my dad was a magician and an inventor. And one day I'm sitting in the green room at, at QVC in London, and I'm not happy. Things have just hit a weird rock bottom for me. And I think I was on my knees going, I, I don't I don't know what to do next. I'm it's up to you. And in walked a gentleman with a little thing. And it was like two o'clock in the morning. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, this is an office de-stressor. I said, <laughs> I said, really? And I tried it and it went like that. And I'm like, that, that's kind of stupid. And I gave it back to him. I gave it back to him. He goes on TV and he is doing it and he sells like 500 of them. And he's doing this and everyone's loving it. And I'm like, he comes back into the green room and I said, okay, help me understand this. What is this thing? <clears throat> and I touched it and now I got it spinning. Now, Linda, my hand to God, I saw a vision of my life. Something I'd never seen before. I saw that this is the greatest fitness product ever. I saw all the things you could do with it. And I looked at him and I said, how do I get one? How do I get this? He said, well, you're Forbes Riley here, take this one. I said, no, 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 tell me about your company. Now I never ever asked anybody something like this. And he said, well, it's funny you should ask that. I'm a corporate magician. I've been doing this for five years. I've only sold 100,000. I'm pretty much done. If you could sell 25,000 of these in the US, I will give you the company. You give me a little small percentage. And I said, okay. And I came <laughs> home with this and I showed my then husband going, look what I got. And he's like, I don't get it. Like, that's okay. I spent six months downloading every exercise, the abs, the arm. I mean, I've got I, I, every, there's 150 different exercises you do with this that no one's ever seen. You're going to work your triceps like this. You're going to work your punching like this. Here's another tricep exercise. You can sit back and engage your abs. I went down the whole list. I architected everything like I was getting downloaded from some other source. And then Christmas time came. Oh, I totally believe in that. 
And I gave one to my girlfriend here in St. Pete and she looked at it and she said, that's nice. Um, can I be honest? I'm like, sure. She's like, I'm never going to use it. And she gave it back to me. Now a sane person gives up at that moment going, yeah, you're right. I, I said, well, this is ridiculous. How can you not get this? And so now I'm thinking, all right, distribution, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And I didn't have a whole lot of marketing skills back then. I was the face of everybody's product. I'm a great pitcher, but there's more to marketing than pitching. <clears throat> so I have it in my pocket, but you know what I have, Linda, I have what you talked about. I have a dream. I have a dream that this is it. Suzanne Summers is to thigh master as Forbes Riley is to spin gym. And anybody would ask me, that's what I would tell them. And I said it over and over and I'm in Los Angeles, in Las Vegas, and they're shooting a, a TV series called pitch men. And they come up to me and they said, so, hey, Forbes, you know, what are you working on? I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And I said, wait a second, I've got a spin gym in my pocket. They're like, what? I said this. And they said, oh, can you show that to Billy Mays and Anthony Sullivan? I said, okay, they sell soap. They said, no, no, we're doing a TV series. They try it. They love it. We fly to New York with the as seen on TV guy who created that whole logo. And the next thing I know, for five months of my life, I'm going to be designing this product while reality cameras are filming me. And it was, now this is great, right? This is the roller coaster where you're going up, you're going up, you're like, oh, this is going to air on Discovery. It's going to change my life forever. <laughs> well, Linda, the guys who produced that show, Operative Word Guys, had a very different idea about women in business. I thought women should be seen and not heard at all. And they set out to make a point about that. And they pretty much trashed this and me in the episode. The episode starts out great. You know, the Titanic starts out really good. And then they set out to edit things that I didn't say and made me look really bad. And I have a video of me watching that, what they're doing to me. And it's, it's so painful. Oh my gosh, I'm sure. I woke up the next morning because reality TV, I was doing reality. They were making television. And I rolled over. My partner said, so, um, huh, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to sell spin gyms. He said, but nobody wants it. I said, they're wrong. He said, they can't all be wrong. And I said, but they are. And on that moment, I mortgaged my house, my kids' education fund, and everything I had to make this. And I set out on a journey and I'm not going to show the whole journey with you because it's crazy, including fighting at U.S. Customs for six days, having people do tra uh, the journey is worth of a movie like the movie Joy. And it will be at some point because it's a powerful journey because on uh, I mean, the exact date, but let's just say 2017, we had a 24 hour sale. I sold 64,000 of them in one day and got a check for $1.2 million. Anyway. Oh, my goodness. Oh my gosh. And you know, with these rock bottom moments, it's just this roller coaster ride of life. It's like your movie's more interesting now because you had your rock bottom. But how did you find your way out of your rock bottom? What was your, I mean, some people just give up and quit, Forbes. What kept you driving on? I'm going to say that it's my faith. And my faith whispers in my ear. I hear. I, I'm much, very much of a loner. I've traveled all around the world by myself. I, I've done a lot of things. I haven't had a coach for most of my life. I am my own coach. And I've coached my way into and out of some pretty insane experiences. And I've always had this little thing in my ear that I hear. And I'm just going to call it an angel. Because I don't think it's God. I think God's busy taking care of the athletes and the musicians. Just kidding. But I hear an angel. I hear something that says in the darkest of my moments where life has been crap and it really, really has for me at moments, you're not done. Somebody needs you. And then I created those somebodies. I created two beautiful children who I know need me. My fiance, who I just love very much needs me. The women who I can inspire need me. And I've always felt that, that this life isn't about me. And, I, and I've gone through amazing things. I mean, and my, you just go through my career alone. I helped start the X Games. I was the host of the Laugh Factory in Los Angeles interviewing uh, or introducing Robin Williams and Ellen DeGeneres and Jerry Seinfeld. I'm a comedian. I had a national radio show right there with Casey Kasem, Body by Jake, 194 infomercials. What? 
this month you can see me in a movie called Farm to Fork to Love. I've starred in about 20 movies and 10 TV series. QVC and HSN, and I'm in the National Fitness Hall of Fame. I'm sorry, who are you again? And it's because I've always heard this little voice that just looks for the white spot. And I'm as energetic, I'm as energetic as I am now. I've got two books I'm working on finishing. I have 9,000 students that I've graduated since March of last year. 9,000 that I've personally coached through Zoom. I sit here 40 to 50 hours a week since the middle of COVID. People go, oh, I had a pivot. I'm like, pivot this, are you kidding me? I have students around the world from Antarctica to Africa. This is the best thing that's happened to us, knock on wood. Not people who've lost their lives, and I'm sorry about that, including my publisher passed away from COVID. I, I get what it can do, but I also get that because of it, we've had massive change in communication, and it changed my entire life. And then my daughter, who is now just turned 19, this she built a business with me. She's the CEO of my company. She is the CEO of my company. We started when she was 17. Before her 18th birthday, we'd grossed a million dollars. She hasn't gone to college yet because she's not old enough, but she's made more money than most adults who've graduated 10 times over. She's, she's got college right there, alive and up front, close and personal with you. And she's like, learning from you. And it's just, it's amazing to me, all that you've accomplished, all that you've done. And I just, I, I, I'm in awe. It's rare that I'm in awe, but I'm just in awe of, the life you've lived. And you are such a great storyteller. That is an art. I, I love the stories. How can somebody out there that has an amazing story, but doesn't know how to articulate it? What is What are the secrets of telling your story so that people are engaged and that it, you know, like, you don't want to be like, I, 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 but you want it to be so that it engages them because something's in it for them too, right? That is the $64,000 question. How do you convey your story? I coach that because I love that. One of my mentors is the great Les Brown, who is love, a great- Love, 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 Les. Love One Les. of the ways that you get to be a great storyteller is listen to great stories. So my journey of, you have to decide what you want. I've always wanted to be a great storyteller. It was an absolute architecture. When I was in high school, we had to pick and do a one man or one woman show. And you had to pick a historical character or anybody that you wanted. You know, I chose back then, I was about 14 years old. I chose Hans Christian Andersen, a guy, first of all. <laughs> and you know what he did for a living? He told stories like The Ugly Duckling. And he was played in the movie. Love those by, stories, yes, yeah. Um, who, who who played him in the movie? Uh, oh, Danny Kay played him in the movie. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be one of the world's greatest storytellers. What's a strange occupation? Now, before uh, uh, Bill Cosby did whatever he did, he was one of the greatest storytellers. He would sit on stage and tell stories. Garrison Keillor did that. Whoopi Goldberg did a one woman show like that. Lily Tomlin. Now, the funny thing about Lily is Lily wrote a show two decades ago called Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. I saw it on Broadway. I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe what I was watching. 20 years later, she would hire me to do that show for her. I played all 15 characters and I got to live. You're like, this is, this is, these are strange ways that you predict what you want. So my thought is I do a couple of things, Linda, and I don't know if you know all that I do. Mm -mm. One of the things that I do that I'm very proud of is I, when I was 31 years old, got exposed to a personal development concept about experiential learning. And I trained in it for a little while. And I realized that learning out of books is so antiquated and not helpful. It's why you can't remember most of the things that you learn because it's stored in a short term memory bank and then it's gone. But if you've experienced something, you will never forget it because your body, your mind, your neurons lit up. And so I set out to heal people. And it's a weird little calling. I call it the breakthrough. And I've been doing it. I started in my living room. I brought in 14 people. I charged them and I said, we're going to go just go through this with me. And I began to build this crazy concept. I now do it. I still only do 14 people a month. I do it every month. And it's based on a couple of principles. Number one, memories are not real. Number two, your timeline is adjustable and can be changed. 
If you let go of the baggage in your past, you get to write a beautiful future. If you don't, you are only rewriting what's already sucked for you and you're gonna keep living that. And people who go through this training, um, say, they all say the same thing, I feel lighter. I, I just feel like I can conquer the world. When's the last time you felt like that? And if that's a gift that I could give to people, my kids have experienced this our whole lives, they're, um, people would just touch me and start crying. Now, I'm not sure what part of my personal talent or a crazy gift, I don't know. I watched a kid play piano at three and some eight-year-old sing opera. We all get gifts, right? So, Linda, can I try something on you? Yeah. Okay, and we don't know, I can't wait to interview you. I, by the way, what are you doing tomorrow at two o'clock? Tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm free. Really? You want to be on my podcast? I, I have do. A national, I have a national radio show. All right, you I, book. I do. That's really funny. I'm short of guests tomorrow. We'll give you the information <laughs> you just got because I need to hear your story. All okay. Right. So what's your first memory in life? My first memory of life. This is bad. I, um, I was drowning. How old were you? Uh, two. Okay. What happened? Um, my mom and dad, we were on vacation, my brother, and we, they were with a bunch of friends and there was a pool and I didn't, I just jumped in with my brother and, um, nobody realized that I went down and under and into the water and what I was not coming back up. And I was, I was drowning and I could have stood up. Now this is the crazy part. I didn't realize that if I would have stood up, that I wouldn't be drowning. I was just too young to understand what was going on. And I remember looking up, I, I feel like I said a prayer and I just, you know, like from my baby heart and I looked up and a hand was coming down, reaching for me. And my, it was my dad and he had jumped in with his clothes and he pulled me out of the water and he, he was that rock for me, my whole entire life. My dad, what, what decision did you make about life based on that moment? That you have to stand up or, you're, or, you know, when you're drowning, you have to stand up. Wow. So Linda, I don't know much about your life, but how has that one phrase served you? Well, <laughs> When I was uh, in a marriage where I was being smothered and strangled to death, I realized that I had to stand up and, and face my six foot four giant, which was my husband, and get over the intimidation and leave the marriage that I had to stand up on my own two feet That's and awesome. do something about it. If you had not been saved by someone like that, maybe that might not have been your choice. But you've also done this in business, haven't you? Where you've had to stand up and make it count. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. Times everybody. people right, tell you everybody. you can't do it. Right. But not everybody has that, because what happens is that decision based on your first memory is the basis of your operating system in your head. You operate from a very powerful position because of that. Now. You also have a little bit of battle, I think, inside because there's also that fear of drowning, which also plays just a little bit over there. And so sometimes you won't take a chance because you don't want to have to experience the drowning before you stand up. Am I correct? Oh, gosh. Yeah. There's times when you're like you you think what is worse, you know, and you don't want to you don't want to experience that. Or like when you were asking me the questions on your master class not really wanting to have the surgery because it's painful but you know what uh, every time something like that has happened it has lightened me like you said it it has freed me lightened me and taken some of that off it's heavy right yeah i'm excited to talk to you tomorrow but to figure out what your big hopes and dreams are that's a, i've never heard that particular story um i've heard lots and lots of stories over the years of people starting out good or starting out bad and how, if you are holding resentment and anger towards what has happened to you, you don't really ever overcome it. If you were silenced because you heard mom and dad yell about money and you have very bad money issues, those are, those are fixable things because memories are not real. Even the memory that you chose to remember. Now, I like your memory because your memory is not 
well, I actually would work on replacing the drowning memory because you don't ever need that again. What you do want to hang on to, though, is the dad reaching and, give, and giving you and hanging, you know, being your rock. But I will tell you, you can, through hypnosis and NLP, erase the drowning part so that it never affects you again. And I believe it would make you more daring than you already are. Who knows? I love that. I love that. That is so cool. And that was like... I'm sure eye opening for anybody listening, because whenever I hear you on Clubhouse helping people or your master class, I love just being a listener because I learn so much from what you're doing with other people. It's just so eye opening. And I'm just like, so like, I just got to say it again. I'm so honored to have you on this show. And I just love the way that you have shown up in your life and how you're so much about helping others. And that right there to me is is what took you up to where you are today is just how you have helped so many people. You know, yes, and thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna say that I didn't set out to do that. I'm gonna say that I was very happy being an actress And when you're an actress, you're very self-centered because it is all about you. You have to maintain your body, your hair, your looks, your press, whatever you're doing. And then you get to show up to work where they call you Miss Riley. They bring you the script. They bring you the water. They bring you food. They're very lovely to you. And then you get to go to the Academy Awards. It's a very strange, blessed, wonderful life. And I was loving it. Somehow along the way, I think the universe had other plans for me. And I can, if you think that I'm weird when I say it, that's okay. I, I am so weird like that. Forbes, you don't even know. I, I hear the same little voice or yep. the, the same, like get the vision where nobody understands it, but you, but you're like, you see it so clear. You see it so clear. So I had the lead, I had the lead in a TV series. This was what I wanted so much. I was in my early forties. I had two little babies and I was on a high I, and I, the pilot, you can see it if you go to Fashion House with Forbes Riley on YouTube, you'll see that um, that uh, the, the guy who was engaged to Larry, to, uh, to Lady Gaga, was played my son, Taylor Kinney. It was, I was very excited to be the matriarch of this whole show. And at the end of the day, we were waiting to get the final word, and they decided that my name at that point wasn't famous enough to launch a series on, and they replaced me with Bo Derek. Okay. Uh, my agent called me and said, hey, you know what? We love you. You're really good. I'm going to let you go. I- I'm sorry. What? Now, I'm on a road here. I'm ready to be a movie television star. Sandra Bullock, Julie Roberts, and Forbes Riley. And all of a sudden, I got cut off at the knees. And my agent said, look, he said, I'm getting older. You make all this money doing infomercials. Agenting is a crappy business. My son's going to take it over. He's 20 years old, and he only wants 20-year-old clients. You're too old. At 44, I was too old. I'm like... What am I supposed to do? He said, now listen to this. He said, you should go brand yourself. Now, at that point in the history of our mankind, there was no such thing as a personal brand. There were, what does it mean brand yourself? It was branding yourself back 20 years ago. And he said, yeah. And he said, if you still want to act, you should make enough money and buy your own movie. Under my breath, I cursed him out. I know I did. And I stood on the other side of the door and I had a moment where I believe I looked up and said, really, really? I said, I get, I know what's going on here. I'm not going to get to act for a while, am I? And it was the most bizarre thing, this conversation I had. I said, I can't be mad at him, but I would appreciate if it was like, oh, this is, it was, it was the, it was my massive epiphany followed by meeting my product. That's how I got to the product. So that happened first. And that was part of the lowest low of my entire life. And I remember saying, well, then if you've got some other plan, you better show it to me because this is not making any sense. And I'm very, very pissed. And that's when this walked in the door and my life took the most radical turn and it was handed to me, but it didn't look like anything. And it was up to me, all my ingenuity, all my money, all my beliefs. I can teach a, a college level master class on how to get a product out to the market on what it means to have perseverance when every single thing is against you and you're going to survive anyway. That makes a much better story than just being a little actress. And I've had a lot of moments that I've reflected over the years of what I have gone through 
It has been hell. It has been war. It has been, it doesn't get any more chaotic and devastating than to launch your own product the way that I did. I don't recommend it. At the end of the day, though, I ended up with something spectacular. And I have moments where I'm, I've got a, a beautiful role in a movie right now called Farm to Fork to Love that's on Amazon Prime. And I have another movie on Netflix. I'm not, I didn't become a big actress, not yet. But I remember that moment very clearly where I could feel the universe saying, you're meant for more than just you. You're not giving back. You're not doing all that you were put here to do. To which I said, well, then show me because I don't get it. I like the acting thing. And I put my head down. I did the work. I committed to people. I developed a relationship with my own personal faith that said, this is what you're going to do. And you're going to become a really good speaker about it because I only see men. I see Tony Robbins and Damon John and Les Brown and Deepak Chopra. I want, I don't see me anywhere. I, I think me has to be heard and me just being a woman, me being a woman who's not 22, me being a woman who's been put down, has almost died a few times, went through freaking tragedies and is a great storyteller. And it's like, oh shit, I asked for that. <laughs> Damn it. You got to have good stories if you're going to be a storyteller. And nobody tells the stories of, oh, it was just airy fairy. No, it's going down to the depths and coming back up and going down again. Let me tell you, if you can keep coming back up and then you lock arms with people who have even bigger stories and you start doing podcasts and you start sharing people's stories because that is what life is about. And then when Clubhouse came about, I'll tell you what, my life changed again because Clubhouse is my ideal medium. Number one, as a woman, I do not have to put on a stitch of makeup, do my hair or my nails, and I can be naked in a bathtub. <laughs> Let me tell you. It is a big deal. If you're a bald man, you has to spend three hours doing his hair, uh, you know, an hour doing your makeup. The eyel Clubhouse is my jam. <laughs> and the day that it came out, I thought, wow. And then you have to have courage because you are talking to a box where you cannot see anybody. And all of a sudden, all that time when I had a national radio show, it's like, oh man, I know how to inspire people right now just through the way I speak, through the things I think. And then I granted myself permission to take the stage and That's go. That's huge. That's the biggest step, right? It is so many times you're like, oh, do I jump in? Do I jump in? But I'll tell you what, one of the things that keeps me going, see, Spin Gym is more than just a product. So it's the kind of thing, check this I out. Know, you know, when we Spin Gym, I get people give me all kinds of excuses saying, oh, I'm so weak in my arms. What do you think about people who have excuses? Do you see Pedro? Yeah. This is the only wow. way of getting, you know, problems right there is the person making the excuses. You know, the whole world is going to keep spinning, but the person that makes excuses is going to, it's not going to get anywhere. He lost his arms and his legs to a flesh eating disease overnight. And when I look at him with the energy, he wanted to meet me. And then when I made him spin gym, or when I look at Mac Gray, I realize. Hi Forbes, I'm working with my new spin gym. Oh my goodness. As you can see, I have uh, some adaptive straps on here because I can't grip it with my hands, but I can use it on my arms. And if I want to, I can just put one down here. Love um, that. Different exercises I can. I'm Christine and I'm doing the spin gym. <laughs> what are you fighting? What are you dealing with in your chair? Um, I have a disability called a cerebral palsy. I would so Christine and I met in the park eight years ago because of my little spin gym. We are best friends. She graduated valedictorian of her class. I just talked to her yesterday. We talk all the time. She called me when, she, when I inspired her to become Miss Wheelchair 2019 and go to the Nationals because I met her in the park because of my spin gym. I have created my own personal miracle factory of people that I've been blessed to know. And so that moment when my agent said, I'm gonna let you go, what the universe was telling me is it let me go in the direction to serve many more people than I ever would have if that hadn't happened. But when that door closed, I didn't quite realize it. So for all of you listening, when your door closes, you can tell me what you want, 
Will you get it? You might, you might not. When you work really hard and keep your head down, you'll get something. And as you know, it's been told, if you reach for the stars and you really go for it with no plan B, the very least you land on the moon, not so shabby. And so a combination of going for what you believe you want and then listening to the signs that are all around you to keep pushing you and guiding you. And I do believe that true bliss comes from the service of others, of elevating people's dreams, of giving more than you get, of being wildly passionate without regard for personal gain. I have a lot of nice things, but I didn't set out to do that. I give a lot of my time. And the biggest thing that you can do for me is send me a thank you. I have thousands of testimonials. People say I changed their lives. Do you know that when I hear that, Linda, I just want to cry. I just want to go, how did this little girl with her chunky thighs and her broken nose and everyone thought she was going to become nothing, get thousands of thank yous for transforming my life? Thank you for helping me. I have a, one of my friends. I stood for him for a long time and he got so mad at me. We were living in a house together and he kicked me out because he's like, you just don't stop. And I'm like, no. The next year he said, I, I want him to go to this training I was doing. He met his wife in my training. He claims all of his four kids are because he knows me because I wouldn't give up on him. You want those stories in your life. That's what makes it all makes sense to me. Makes it all worthwhile. And you know, you were disappointed when that happened, but God had something better for you. And I just think when we do have a disappointment and a closed door, we need to look for the open door because that's the, there's always an open door. I loved meeting you in Clubhouse. I, I, as soon as I heard you and saw you, I was doing research and I just fell in love going, oh, I need to know this sister. I need to know <laughs> mission. And tomorrow at two o'clock, I'm going to put you on. My podcast is listened to by tens of thousands of people. Uh, it goes out to my 1.8 million fans on Facebook and it lives on a national radio show. So and I am beyond excited right now, yeah. Forbes. Woo! Okay. And how we do it. you did not disappoint. You deliver 100% every time I've heard you. And I just adore you, I have to say. And I know my people will too. And everybody out there listening today, get a spin gem because you should see Forbes' arms. She didn't even show her arms off. 61 and no 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 hanging arms no, I mean, no. she looks good in a tank top and that i'm serious it's it's just like i've got to have one now <laughs> I'll, I'll show you one little thing before we go okay if you want to reach out to me by the way go to forbesriley.com i have a lot of links that are there and if you go to free gift from forbes riley you will find a wonderfully valuable it's like 300 dollars gift uh, that I give that I would love your audience to experience and enjoy, but I'm going to see you tomorrow. Yes. yes. And thank you so much for coming on the show. I can't wait to be on your show tomorrow and we're all going to be better for listening to Forbes today and get our spin gems. <laughs>